Our next speaker will be Jan Slomp, who will talk about the effects of GMO and glyphosate use with respect to the sustainability of farming. Jan Slump and his partner, Marion, have owned and operated a dairy farm since 1979 for the first 10 years in the Netherlands and since 1989 in central Alberta. Jan milked his first cow in 1962 and has seen dairy farming change from before 1960 without any fossil fuel through the Green Revolution into a highly intensive and productive sector. He altered his objectives in the 90s from ever-increasing productivity into a more holistic and sustainable farming approach. The number one guide in pursuing his goals is soil and animal health. Jan is board member of the National Farmers Union and in that capacity was active in getting a ban on the use of bovine growth hormone in Canada. He is compelled to warn fellow farmers about the lack of the precautionary principle in the regulatory regime for agriculture in North America. Jan is delegate for Alberta Milk. Jan and Marion's farm was one of three contestants for the 2013 Dairy Farmers of Canada Sustainability Award. Jan Slump. Thank you very much for that introduction and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Frain, for your presentation. Uh, I, I was somewhat familiar with, with most of the uh, the things you you were uh, saying, but I, I'm actually shocked again about the complete lack of uh, of our, our regulatory regimes in North America to the precautionary principle and to protect us public and protect us dairy farmers. Um, I I am fully in respect of that letter that was sent by the BC milk producers. We as dairy farmers are under tremendous pressure to do a good job. And how can we but rely on a government that does its job for us to provide honest and fair information to what is sustainable and, and, and healthy to us. So I'm, I'm actually very angry towards our, our institutions of failing us, failing the public and failing us farmers by by misleading us and not doing any of the jobs they're supposed to do. Anyway, that wasn't part of my preparation, but I'll, I'd like to go back to, to my early childhood. I, I have memories of my parents milking the cows by hand in the 50s. And I was four years old when they bought a milking machine. Up to that point, it was virtually a system without any fossil fuel use other than maybe two light bulbs in the barn. So I, I'm very thankful for having lived through that full era of a massive change. And we hear from the environmental community often a lot of criticism about the Green Revolution. But our town had hundreds of dairy farmers before it started. It has 17 left. I'm talking the town in the Netherlands. Those 17 probably produced four times as much milk as these hundreds did in the 60s. So I've lived through the Green Revolution. I've seen the enormous productivity increase on, on an individual farm, in our animals, and the revolutionary development of knowledge. We introduced plastic foley to, to cover our silage in 1963. Only that invention allowed us to preserve precious energy harvested in the summer to make that available in the heart of winter to our cows. It basically doubled the milk production. Just that single invention. I'm very thankful for the Green Revolution. We, what we failed to do, and what our governments are failing us to every day, is to adjust it for a, a, a renewed balance of what is healthy and what is sustainable. We have had overkill in the last 30 years towards more is better, productivity increase. And the sad thing is it doesn't even serve us as farmers at all anymore. It puts us on the treadmill of forever investing in more and new technology and becoming dependent 
on these things. And, and it saddens me as I have developed a different path for myself, weaning myself from all these scientific inputs and learning a new esteem for a natural way that still allows my cows to produce three times as much as in 1960, but that I can honestly say through all my journey I have not seen healthier animals than I have today on my farm. So it is possible. It is possible to produce very healthy food with a sustainable system today and seven billion people in the world is not a problem to feed. But we need to reestablish rigorous regulatory regime that look out for the public good and ignore what, the, what it does to corporate interests. We need, we need corporations to thrive, but towards the bigger goal of public interest. Again, I didn't prepare that last part either. <laughs> so, what has changed throughout my journey? I have fully embraced on my own farm in the 70s all these technological advantages. And I've seen that productivity increased. I've also seen my debt load increase. I paid in 1981 $185,000 in interest alone. My income was 20000 But it, it was working. And mind you, I have paid it all off <laughs> by now. But the, the interesting thing is that discovering the sustainable way in all of that has made me free of debt. And there is, a, there is a third way that brings us the needs of a society and the needs of farmers. And we need to claim, reclaim governments leading us in finding that way. What has changed in the public sphere is that before 1980, our departments in agri of agriculture in North America as well as in Europe were working on democratic principles. One of their goals was to have farmers move into higher productivity with new technologies, with the research communities working alongside us to provide us with answers how to do that. What they applied, more or less, not in every corner, I believe they applied it more in Europe than in North America, was precautionary principle in the scientific outcomes. We do not tolerate a, a tremendous risk like we do today with GMOs. We develop for the overall public benefit. Ever since Milton Friedman in, in the U.S. got a hold of politicians and turned their nose towards corporate interests, we have seen this deteriorate. We, we now have governments depending on voters once in four or five years, and for the rest of that time, they dedicate themselves towards the, the vested interests of corporate and Wall Street powers. And that's where we have a deterioration starting of our regulatory regimes. Trade is trumping sovereignty. Precautionary pre principle is replaced by owners of proof. If our, our scientists working for Health Canada have the guts to say to a company, do some more testing because I, I question the safety of that and that aspect, they might get away with it once. But the next time the company will say, prove to me that it is not safe. You see, we have, we have flipped this whole thing around. Plus, we now have the blessing of governments that have stripped these departments of so much funds. There is no scientists, real scientists, or not many at least, employed anymore by a regulatory regime. We totally decide that, that approval on, on the submissions of the science of the companies, which makes it very shaky, if you ask me. The, the public policy roles in agriculture have changed. The goals have changed from before 1980, the need to generate farm income. That has completely been left out of the equation in the latter 30 years. 
we, we are seeing departments advocating further industrialization of agriculture, but never do they make decisions on the basis of would it be good for farm income. And most farmers are left in the dark just thinking that technological inventions are leading to higher incomes. Productivity increase is leading to higher incomes. They're left in the dark with that illusion. One thing to, to look at as to what our regulatory regime has morphed into is the issue of BST, bovine growth hormone, when it was uh, uh, asked for approval in Canada by the company that makes it, Monsanto. Uh, the, the trade name is Posilac. We had three years of moratorium because people were reluctant and farmers were reluctant and the government held it off. But then in, in uh, 1999, after three moratorium, the, the, uh, the government had to make a decision whether to approve it or permanently disapprove it. And so the House of Commons had passed the approval. It was up to the Senate to decide. And the National Farmers Union was instrumental in visiting as many senators on the eve of that vote as possible. Dr. Frain is, is starting a tour with, with Shiv Chopra, the senior scientist working for Health Canada at that time. He warned our governments, this is not safe. The reason, I'm not a scientist by the way, so forgive me if I make mistakes here. The reason why Dr. Chopra decided that it wasn't safe was that there was clearly a measurable increase of insulin growth when people were, would consume that Pasolac induced milk production. There was clearly an increased risk for people to develop cancer. The reason why in the end the decision was made not to approve it was based on the facts that in the United States numbers showed significant increase in the animals of bone cancers that were exposed to Pasolac injections. So it, to me that's very sad that we, we cannot use the most important thing, the possible effects, negative effects on people as an excuse to ban these things, that we have to resort to a more rigorous proof that it's unhealthy for animals. In the meantime, we all should be thankful that this has never had approval in Canada, especially as dairy farmers. We should be really thankful for the people like Chef Chopra that stood up and said no. Our political system works like that, and this is, this is why Mr. Chopra, Dr. Chopra, is still employed by Health Canada, but he is non-active. He's never retired or, or, or was fired because he had a gag order placed on him for speaking out about this unsafety aspects of the growth hormone. The Prime Minister's office gave him direct notice to approve this drug at the time. You know, we can ask why, but Dr. Chopra stood up and said no. Him, Dr. Chopra, Margaret Hayden, and Lambert, three senior scientists for Health Canada, were all gag ordered for their stance against the health risks of introducing this. Until today, they are well in their 70s. They are still officially employed by Health Canada. They still have that gag order. They still have never been apologized to. For, for their firm stance. And that is symptomatic for our regulatory regime, how it operates in North America. And maybe I haven't been clear, but, but I've witnessed it firsthand and I was shocked. So on our own farm, knowing these things, I've altered, I've learned to distrust the, the approval of authorities for drugs, for systems. And I've learned that uh, I would rather earn a little bit less and not go for certain inventions. 
The interesting thing is, uh, as I, you know, I give you a clear example of what we changed. In, in the early 70s, back in the Netherlands, we introduced dry cow treatment to prevent mastitis. As our productivity kept increasing per cow, the memory systems are under higher stress. It, we had more trouble with mastitis. One way to clean up uh, and other lingering infections, potentially lingering infections, was when you dry off a cow two months prior to calving, you would shoot antibiotics in the quarters. After calving, you would throw that milk away for a number of days to respect the withdrawal time. And then this cleared up udder would be trouble free from then on. And as a systematic use of antibiotics that worked for a long time. In the early 90s, being a few years in Canada, we had such mastitis problems on our farm that I discussed this with our veterinarian and I said, half my cows come in fresh with mastitis and I use treatments all the time. I have to throw so much milk away. I, I'm getting desperate from this preventative measure so I decided, I told her, I said, I'm going to quit doing this because it's not working. I'll see that what, it, what the consequences are. I expect it not to, you know, not too rigorous a change. But within a year, we completely solved our mastitis problem by, by staying away from, from preventative use. And I'm not telling dairy farmers here to do the same. I don't want that responsibility. But because that change came with a lot of other changes, backing off, intensive use, backing off, maybe backing off uh, obtaining or, or achieving high milk production. Whenever, whatever we changed, it always, I was always prepared to do it for a little bit less revenue, to lose some income. The outcome was always it went up. So our cows are well below average in terms of production, but our input costs have dropped so far that we are well, well ahead. There is, with that production, room for more dairy farmers, <laughs> which I think solves a lot of problems. But it, it, it has been an education to not fully trust what the corporate world and our extension services are telling us. And not, not that I want every farmer to copy what I do, you know, unless you go through that same learning process. So let's have a, a close look to what, what happens with Roundup. Uh, it, it was introduced in my world in 1974. I've used it. When it was introduced, they said after four days of spraying a grassland with it, with weeds in it, you can turn your cattle in it. It's innocent. It's absolutely without any toxic effects. I, I'd never done that. I didn't trust it right away that well. But after learning tonight again from Dr. Frame the, the real effects of glyphosate use, I'm so happy I never did trust it that much. So for, for decades, we used it as an all weed killer, typically in, in my farming way to clean up a weedy grassland that was mismanaged by me, otherwise the weeds wouldn't be there. And then renew the seeding with, with varieties that were productive. That is the change, that, that is the, the system that has Europe adopted to as well. What are we doing today? You know, and, and I don't want to go in these other things as they have been very well explained by, by Dr. Frame. It was introduced in our world in 74, initially to kill all weeds. Then the GMOs were introduced. So before, we would typically use it on the, pra on the prairies too, once in four or five years to clean up a weed field. With the GMOs, we, had, we started using it at least once a year and I know most canola, canola fields around me get three applications per year. And then what, what really devastates me now 
is our grain farms are so big. The grains grown on the prairies are not, not GMOs. But we have so many acres to harvest with the combines. We have such large farms that conventionally we would go out to combine and test for moisture content of the grain. If it was well over 16%, we couldn't harvest. That wasn't dry enough unless we had facilities to dry it. So typically, you would run around with the combine several fields and find a field that was dry enough and you combine. Today, we use Roundup on, on most of the grains. Most farms are so big, so large, so intensely farmed. We spray Roundup on all our grains, wait four days, and then it doesn't matter what the weather does, the sap flow has absolutely stopped in the grain and is ready to combine. We can do planned combining for many hours in the day thanks to desiccation. So the glyphosate use has been intentionally, in, intensively growing since the 90s, since the GMO introduction. And now we have also fully embraced the desiccation and, and it's, it's sickening on the prairies to see how much glyphosate is sprayed on the grain. So I am absolutely paranoid that my cows don't get any purchased feed anymore. I want to grow everything on my own land so I can avoid all these chemicals. But where is that grain going? It comes into large trains to the ports of Vancouver. It goes all over the world. The whole world population is eating Roundup in its bread, in its pastas. It is, it is absolutely a disaster in the making. And after hearing Dr. Frame, what, what it does to our guts, we have to stand up and stop this sickening process. We, and, and, you know, there is a vital, vital alternative. First of all, our farms shouldn't be that big. We should have extension service showing farmers that different approaches towards weed control, new varieties, public breeding of varieties. Anyway, I'm ahead of my... My picture's already again, sorry, or I, I'm interjecting with another other information, but desiccation is, is a huge problem that is, is below the surface, but I'm facing it every day. Wheat resistance in the U.S. Dr. Frayne had a way better slide about Canada. We have the Monsanto lobby. Most of you are familiar with it. We had an introduction this year in Congress to have Monsanto excluded from legal prosecution. It, it, it was killed by my knowledge, by knowledge, by the Senate. Uh, there are studies, Dr. Frayne had way better information. I, uh, I think I have to wrap up. As I say, I've been a, a board member of the National Farmers Union. I've been a member uh, for, for 12 years before I became board member. It has been absolutely the best education of my life to become a, a, a member and a board member of the National Farmers Union. I learned about plant breeding. I learned about um, the conventional ways of plant breeding, all in the public sphere. Everywhere in Canada, we had research station, well, publicly funded research station, lots of scientists, employees, all the time breeding new varieties of all the crops we farmers need to grow. A Cadillac system compared to most other nations in the world. We have systematically, since the 80s, underfunded these institutions. We've created, we farmers knew new varieties all the time to outsmart nature with, with disease, with, with agronomic factors to, to move ahead. And that is one thing we conventionally know but what does Monsanto do? <laughs> they have a very, very few varieties available. They are actually limiting the varieties in their technology instead of multiplying it like we need to do. So we need to restore the public funds for plant breeding all over Canada. Not only are they doing good work, they are catering to farmers in microclimates between Rimby and Lacombe, there is three, four agriculture communities. Twenty years ago, they would fed their new varieties of barley in their own little microclimates from the research station in Lacombe. 
today we see the same varieties across the prairies. Uh, absolute disasters in the long term. We, we see every time our government signs a trade agreement, we see public plant breeding further impeded and powers transferred to private plant breeding, meaning those varieties will be available for farmers at a way higher cost, often with technology use agreements when we talk GMOs that limit a farmer's ability to do things with it. Most of our grains on the prairies are grown with farmers seeding, uh, saving their seeds and, and making it available for a dollar more per bushel for seeding next year to, the, to, to their neighbors. If we allow this kind of deterioration of public plant breeding to continue, we are only a few years away of paying through the nose on the prairies for seed grains because it will be in private hands in the companies that, that sell us all the other hybrid seeds and GMOs. And, and it's sneaky. It's small print in the trade agreements. There is a, a, a regulatory, international regulatory body called the UPOF 78 that allows us farmers to save clean and clean seed and reuse the common varieties. The UPOF 91, that's a new agreement. A lot of countries have signed on to it because they do very little public plant breeding. But for a country like Canada, it is absolutely devastating. It will mean tremendously cost increase for farmers, and it will mean a limited number of varieties available to farmers. And the European trade agreement, again, nibbled away and brought us further to UPOV 91. And, and it is a secret when it's negotiated and the outcome we have to accept. It is very undemocratic and it's very bad for, for agriculture. So the National Farmers Union has developed policy from before uh, varieties, GMO varieties were available. We have re rejected from the get-go the term substantially equivalent. It is, it is absolutely a farce, as Dr. Frain was already explaining. We should always look at, at genetic resources of food crops as well as, as our human genome as a public property. That cannot be privatized. It is absurd we have, we have our gene pool privatized. That is so against the need for survival of humanity. We, we cannot operate. <laughs> and, then, and then we as citizens should absolutely vocal when we talk to our politicians to demand a reinstitution of precautionary principle when we, when we accept technology, new technology, and extreme new technology like GMOs. And, you know, one thing that would clear this whole thing up, we wouldn't have this meeting if from the get-go we would have GMO labeling required. Eaters, eaters would take precautionary principle on their own behalf and would say, I'm not going to buy that. Anyway, that is, uh, that's the end of my preparation. I have a few, few uh, issues brought in, in front of me as to issues that are very, uh, have very much merit here in the Valley. I, I really empathize with all the dairy farmers in the room. Uh, if they grow GMO corn, I can fully understand why they're doing it. Because corn is, is a very energy-rich crop. And if you have limited land base around your barn, and you have parcels away from your barns, corn growing is, is, makes a lot of sense because you grow a lot of energy and you bring it to the barn and, and it is a perfect match with, with, with alfalfa, with pasture, to get good milk production outside the growing season. But I would say, farmers, you, you ask for weed resistance after 15, 20 years. That will give you so much trouble. It is easier when you start, if you don't consider the risk aspects of, of animal health and people health. I can understand that. I've been there myself. 
but you're asking for a lot of trouble in the long run for the way you run it now. And your animal health is going to be compromised. I, I know farmers in the U.S. that are totally off this, tr this track because they cannot get cows pregnant anymore. So I would recommend to you, demand from your seed dealers the varieties that are grown in Europe that are GMO free, that are as productive, but that take a little bit more of a challenge to do weed control. You maybe have to have crop rotation in order to do it proper. That is a challenge, it's not as easy, but we owe it to the public to produce healthy food and we want to go there. So that's, that's my answer to your local problem. Thank you.